Thank you, Karen. I was waiting to see the recording pop up. So good morning and thank you all for joining us for the 2024 wildfire season briefing. First, I'd like to introduce you all to our new Forest Fire Service Chief Bill Donnelly, who was sworn in by Deputy Attorney General Matt Knobloch at a ceremony at Coil Field Air Attack Base in Burlington County on March 21st. Chief Donnelly first started his career with the Forest Fire Service in 1990 as a forest fire observer in the Mizpa Fire Tower in Hamilton Township, Atlantic County. After working in the tower, Bill was promoted to Forest Fire Control Technician, then Section Forest Fire Warden, serving in Sections C-10 and C-9, before moving into the Division C office, first as an Assistant Division Forest Fire Warden, then Division Forest Fire Warden, and finally as Supervising Forest Fire Warden. He most recently held the title of Assistant State Fire Warden in the Trenton office, leading statewide operations. Um, obviously, Bill has had a long career growing through the Forest Fire Service, and we're delighted to have him in this new role. I also wanted to offer a huge thanks and debt of, grat debt of gratitude to our former chief, Greg McLaughlin, who's also with us here today. Um, Greg directly preceded Chief Donnelly and has been promoted to the Administrator of Forests and Natural Lands within the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection's State Parks, Forests, and Historic Sites Program. In this new role, Greg is overseeing the New Jersey Forest Service, our Office of Natural Lands Management, as well as the New Jersey Forest Fire Service. So with that, we wanted to take this opportunity today with all of you to remind New Jersey residents and visitors to not become complacent of the risks from wildfire, particularly because we have recently seen substantial rainfall in March and, April, and early April. Recognizing the change in climate, we increasingly see dry conditions between heavy rainfalls and what we have come to know as flash droughts. Last year, the research nonprofit Climate Central conducted a nationwide analysis of weather conditions during the past 50 years and found that the annual number of fire weather days has risen by 10 days in northern New Jersey and four days in southern New, New Jersey. Again, an extension of 10 days in northern New Jersey and four days in, in southern New Jersey, an overall extension to our wildfire season. This data mirrors the DEP's own 2020 scientific report on climate change, which states that wildfire seasons could be lengthened and the frequency of large fires increased due to hot, dry periods that will result from increased temperatures. Through last year's state budget, the Murphy administration responded to the busy fire year and these challenging conditions that we've been facing by supporting the Forest Fire Service with a $3 million budget boost to enhance protection of lives and property through investments in new equipment and staff. Many of these investments are now in place for the spring fire season. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Chief Donnelly to discuss the outlook for this wildfire season. Thank you all, and over to you, Chief. All right, good morning, and uh, thank you. All right, first, as uh, the Assistant Commissioner Cecil stated, uh, residents and visitors should not become complacent just because the amount of rain we've had here in March and April. You know, it only takes a day or two with the wind blowing and warmer temperatures like you have today. And no matter how wet it was yesterday, by today we could be having fires. I think that's important that uh, people are aware of that. New Jersey's spring fire season typically runs from mid-March through mid-May. Um, during this time of year, trees, underbrush have not yet leafed up and relative humidity is typically low. Windy days are very common. And uh, the combination of these factors um, means forest lands dry out quickly. And when they dry out quickly, we have uh, we have fires. Additionally, the poor sandy soils, especially in the south here in the Pine Barren area, the Pine Lands region of southern New Jersey, they don't really hold the moisture um, very long. You know, they, they dry up pretty quick, making it possible for a fire to spark only hours after we have some rainfall. So. You know, that's right now, um, you know, it's up to Mother Nature, I guess you could say, as far as what kind of fire season we're going to have. Right now, things don't look uh, to be too bad, but that can all change in a day or two. So um, we're optimistic that we're going to stay where we are now, but um, chances are we're probably not. Sooner or later, we, uh, we'll be getting real busy with some fires for sure. Um, also, I want to talk about our fire towers and our fire observers. For those of you who don't know it, we have 21 fire towers that we still utilize daily when it's dry enough to burn here in 
New Jersey. Um, these uh, towers are staffed um, basically whenever it's dry enough. Like a day like today, we have our towers staffed. And what their job is, is they take weather readings, they maintain uh, the weather that's outside and they look for smoke. Um, and once they see smoke, they will triangulate it and uh, pinpoint the location of the fire and we will send resources right away. Um, depending on the fire, we'll dispatch aircraft, fire trucks, bulldozers, water tenders. But typically the fire towers see these smokes before anybody actually reports them. So having the towers up uh, proved to be very beneficial as far as early detection and uh, quick responses made by our folks out in the field. Um, the fire observers, like I said, are critical in our mission for early detection and just a rapid response to uh, wildfires. Whether these know it or not, New Jersey has some of the most volatile wildland fuels in the country. So having the eyes up in the uh, towers can give us the ability to get resources moving a lot quicker than if we had to wait for folks to uh, actually see a fire, dial 911 and, and do things that route. Um, you know, while they're up there, again, they maintain the weather, wind direction, speed, what the humidity is doing, all that's very important to our folks on the ground trying to extinguish the fire. We have some wildfire stats. Um, thus far this year, um, from January 1st, we've had 218 wildfires, burning a total of 171 acres. Um, not quite as busy as we were the last couple years. Last year, from this January 1st till this time last year, we were at 358 wildfires with 970 acres burned. January 1st through April 8th of 22, we were at 263 wildfires with 352 acres that have burned. And as far back as 21, 2021, January 1st through April 8th, we had had 363 wildfires burning a total of 504 acres. So as you can see, we're starting out a little bit slower than we have the last you know, four years, three years, but obviously that's all subject to change. Prescribed burning this year, where we try to uh, remove the underbrush and manage some of the property, preventing large wildfires. From January 1st up through today, we burned 14,213 acres. Um, this time last year, January 1st through April 8th, we treated 21,275 acres. 22, for that same period, we managed to treat 16,764 acres. And then back in 21, for that same time period, we treated 17,765 acres. Um, I guess moving on to some wildfire prevention tips. Just need folks to be careful when they're out in the forest. When they're out in, uh, you know, be careful with their cigarettes, discarding smoking materials, things like that. Uh, make sure they put them out when they do so. Don't leave unattended campfires. You know, make sure that they're definitely completely doused and cold to the touch. You want to keep the matches and lighters away from children. Um, teach the youth about the fire safety. And if you would like, the children can learn about wildfire safety with Smokey Bear's new mobile app, Smokey Scouts, which that can be brought up on a smartphone. Um, something pretty interesting for the kids to, to check out. And then we have protecting your home and other structures from wildland by creating defensible space. And what that is, is basically space around your home that in the event of wildfire impinges on it, our folks have room to work get between the fire and the improved structures and things like that and hopefully uh, prevent any damage to improve property. Another thing you want to do is make sure that your driveways are accessible. We can get fire trucks down them. That's very important. If our trucks can't get down there, it's going to be a little hard to uh, protect property. Um, if you see suspicious vehicles or individuals that appear suspicious in the area of fires, you want to make sure you report them to the authorities. Um, using wood stoves and stuff. This time of year, it gets cold at night and gets nice during the day. Folks like to burn their wood stoves, fireplaces. 
So you want to be careful about the embers that come out of the chimney, as well as when it's time to dump the ashes, where folks dump them and wherever they dump them, just make sure they are nice and cool and wet before you dump them in the forest. It's not unusual for fireplace ashes to cause a fire a couple days later from just sitting there and smoldering. Um, if you would like a campfire permit, anybody in basically the area here are required to have campfire permits prior to having a recreational fire in your yard. Those folks can reach out to the New Jersey Forest Fire Service field offices. Um, so that's basically all I have as far as a little update as far as what we're expecting here coming into fire season along with some prevention tips. I think it's turned over to you, Greg. Thank you, Bill, and thank you, John, as well. And Thank you all for participating today here at the basically the onset onset or middle of uh, our peak wildfire season, as was mentioned. Um, I think we'd like to take this opportunity um, to talk about some things related to wildfires in New Jersey that uh, cross over between our agency and what you folks do in terms of public messaging and getting the word out about wildfires so that Ultimately, we can prevent wildfires from happening, but when they do, and if they do, um, you know, we can respond to them safely, we can keep the public safe, and we can keep the wildfire small. And th the way we do that is um, we have a really coordinated system that we utilize. Bill mentioned a little bit about the towers that act to detect the wildfires and dispatch resources quickly. Our equipment that we use, our brush trucks, they're constructed in-house and they're very specialized, particularly in the southern part of the state. Uh, they're designed to go off-road, push down trees, push down brush, get to a fire, even if it's in a remote location, suppress that fire quickly. We're successful uh, and on average, we keep 75% or more of all fires under five acres. When the weather conditions are ripe for wildfire start and spread, low humidity, high winds, high temperatures, um, sometimes fires get larger. In the first scenario, we refer to that method as the direct attack method. And we will util utilize not only the trucks, but aircraft as well. And so during a 45 day period uh, that we predict to be peak wildfire season, from about April 1st to mid-May, we'll actually bring in planes from other areas uh, contractually to support our in-house helicopters. These planes fly very quickly. They're stationed strategically around the state. They carry water and they support that quick, direct initial attack to suppress those fires and keep them small. When fires become too large, too quick or, or not accessible, um, we have to then move to a indirect attack method. And so just want to cover some of the terminology that you may hear through our messaging on um, and during wildfire season. First, um, as, as perhaps was mentioned with the numbers, you know, we're responding to over a thousand wildfires a year. Most of those wildfires are kept small. When a fire reaches uh, 100 acres or more, we consider that to be a major wildfire, and that triggers several things for, uh, for us. That's when we'll start to move resources around from other parts of the state. That's when we'll set up a command structure. That's we'll, when we'll start to plan for extended rotations, uh, whether that be you know through the night or through the next day or through several days. Um, and that's the time most likely uh, when you may come out to a fire and we may assemble with you and we may hold or have a press conference. That's the time when we'll be doing um, situation reports. Um, that's when you're gonna get updates on Facebook and Twitter. Um, and during these longer uh, events, uh, our methodology becomes a combination of direct attack and indirect attack because let's face it, these larger fires, as they're growing rapidly, um, they're creating, in a way, their own weather. And 
em embers or what we call fire brands, which are burning pieces of bark and pine cones and pine needles can spread up to a mile and start new fires ahead of, let's say that main fire. So those new fire starts called spot fires, we're gonna continue to direct attack those. And then that larger main fire, we're gonna look to find a strategic area where we can contain that fire in um, and that becomes then when you hear about containment and we release numbers relative to containment, say 10% contain, 40% contain. And that has to do with how comfortable and confident we are in creating this safe perimeter around the fire and where we think the fire is going to go and our ability to create uh, control lines and fire breaks. And so control lines are areas where we can safely light what we call backing fire to conduct a burnout operation. So this is part of the indirect attack method, whereby we're trying to burn out the fuels ahead of the fire, the main fire, to take the energy away from the fire. Um, we have to do that in a very coordinated and controlled way. And we work off of fire breaks. Fire breaks are essentially roads, uh, trails, uh, bulldoze lines, streams, something that we feel confident the fire is not going to cross and that we could safely light our backing fire from to conduct these burnout operations. Um, I think that we started to talk about these maybe three or four years ago, this, this um, terminology so we can kind of all message it the same way and get on the same page sort of just like we do with the prescribed burning season i think the general public thinks of prescribed burning as controlled burning but the technical term we use is prescribed burning because we do it by a prescription by a written prescription right so just um just working with you to get some of the terminology correct whether that's in your messaging or in print uh, or in our communications uh, between us and among us. Um, and Karen has, I believe, a document that she can share with some of this terminology as well. And hopefully we use it correctly and interchangeably to keep it clear. Um, we do have some uh, information as well on our website at njwildfire.org. We post a fire danger dashboard, which gives some indications of you know where we're at uh everyone's seen the smoky signs that have the um adjectives as, as we call them high moderate moderate high extreme very high um these are uh, a rough prediction of how fires may burn if they start and how quickly fires may start in terms of what the conditions in the environment are um this year we also launched uh new jersey wildfire risk.com which is a web-based portal, um, also referred to as the Wildfire Risk Assessment Portal, or NJRAP. And that's a really robust new tool whereby land managers and planners, township officials, and residents um, can go in and can look at the specific area where they live and where their community is and determine what might be their risk. And there's um, numerous tools built within that that talks about what can be done to improve and mitigate some of that risk that they may find. Um, and we have as an agency and a department, various programs to support communities and residents. Um, Bill mentioned defensible space. Um, we have programs whereby we can do some evacuation planning, uh, help residents create defensible space. We offer grants to communities through our Firewise Communities Program. Uh, we work with municipalities to develop what we call CWPPs, Community Wildfire Protection Plans, where we identify risk across a municipality. And then we lay out measures to mitigate those risks. The other, um, the other term that you may hear that I didn't mention, but I think is important to mention, is the concept of a fuel break. So a fuel break is different from a fire break in that a fire break uh, is a non-burnable surface. So it could be water, it could be a road, it could be sand road, it could be blacktop. A fuel break uh, is typically an extension 
and oftentimes adjacent to a fire break. And in most cases, fire breaks and fuel breaks are linear in shape. And there's a reason for that. Um, our winds here, uh, prevailing winds here are from the west. Uh, a lot of our residential development is in the east. And a large, again, especially in the Pinelands, a large pot of fuel, uh, 1 million acres of the Pinelands, um, sits right in the middle. So it's sort of a, it's sort of a recipe that we're concerned about where you have a prevailing west wind, you have heavy, dense, volatile fuels, and then you have a residential development, a downwind effectively of that. So we plan these fire breaks and fuel breaks, uh, if you can visualize in a, a rough north-south direction, so that if fires are starting in the west, traveling to the east, um, we have a means where we can try and stop those fires. And so a fuel break, in effect, is a treatment of the vegetation in different ways, whether that's by cutting, mowing, thinning, uh, to prevent fire from spreading from the ground up through what we call the ladder fuels, which are the shrubs, into the treetops, becoming a crown fire, uh, which are the fastest spreading and most dangerous types of fires because they're burning uh, very quickly and spreading embers across long distances. So we have a combination of things we're doing here in New Jersey to plan uh, fire breaks, fuel breaks. Uh, we use our tower system, we use our trucks, we use you folks for messaging, and we put it all together and hope we're successful. So thank you all for what you do. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Greg. Before we move to the Q&A, I just want to check back with each of our speakers to see if there was anything else you would like to add. Okay. Uh, Greg, you're muted if you're saying something. Okay, so with that, we're going to move to the Q&A portion of our program. We uh, are very happy to see that we have so many media partners on the call. We just ask, uh, as Ken Burns knows the routine here, if you would please use the raise your hand function, and I'll call on you in order to pose your question. We would respectfully ask that, given the number of media on the call, just ask one question for now, if you would, so we can get through everybody, and then we will circle back for follow-ups. Thank you. So with that, um, Ken, go ahead and unmute yourself and post your question. I feel like I should turn my camera on to make sure that everyone knows it's not the Ken Burns. Um, so about a month ago, you uh, the department asked the, or presented a new uh, initiative to help prevent wildfires uh, in South Jersey. Can you discuss that and then kind of tie it into uh, how you how you believe that this initiative will uh, help keep things normal this year. Greg or Bill, you want to take that? I presume this is about the REPI funding and the announcement yes. we had earlier this year. Yes. A month ago. Yeah, so um, that was uh, Department of Defense funding that we received to help support um, this landscape scale initiative that we've been working on for several years to create these combination fuel breaks and fire breaks. Uh, this particular one that we announced at the press event in Manchester Township in the Roosevelt City area was done in cooperation with Manchester Township as well as Ocean County and Ocean County Parks to create a uh, fuel break where we did some mowing and thinning of the trees to get separation uh, between the vegetation, the vegetation at the ground level, the shrub level, and even at the treetop level. And that was done uh, to, again, prevent fire from spreading quickly through that area if a fire were to start and into that uh, very dense um, cluster of homes in the Roosevelt City area, um, which includes Timber Green uh, and Wynwood as well. Um, we just refer to it in general as the Roosevelt City area, um, but it's densely populated with homes surrounded by heavy, 
dense um, fuels that are very volatile and flammable. And we want to make um, we want to make that separation uh, so that firefighters can work safely uh, when they are responding to a fire. They'll have more time, um, and so that fire doesn't spread to those homes and do damage to homes. And hopefully can, we can minimize the impact to the residents. Um, I think what's important to note here is that, um, you know, when we talk about doing things like tree cutting and tree harvesting and manipulation of the forest mechanically with equipment, um, we, we plan this for years. We take time to inventory, uh, and assess all of the resources that are present on site. We look at the soils, we look at the wetlands, we look at drainages, we look at rare species, animals and plants. Um, we look at the type of trees and how those trees may respond. If we cut too many at one time, will the trees blow over? Um, and, and we take all that into consideration and we're not looking to, uh, in, in any means, clear cut or deforest or, uh, you know, top trees or do things like maybe they do along power lines. Um, it's a very planned, coordinated and managed effort. Um, currently, we're working on a fuel break project in Bass River and Little Lake Harbor Townships in the Bass River State Forest, which is linear along Allen Road and Oswego Road as well. Um, and that's an area of historic and significant uh, fires. In fact, uh, Throughout our 100 year history, there was two incidents of fatalities there, um, very heavy fuels, very uh, significant and repeated fire history there. And so it's a very important effort. And we hope to continue to be able to do this, to look at areas throughout um, the state where we can, we can create these, these things strategically. And we're certainly very thankful for the support we're getting from whether it's U.S. Department of Agriculture through the U.S. Forest Service with grant funding or Department of Defense as well. Great. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Greg. And thank you, Ken. Uh, Dino Flamia. Yes. Hello. Uh, I forget the specific number, but I know you said there were over 200 fires so far this year i wanted to know can that just be a because you said you have people in the towers can that just be a little spark that is put out immediately or does some does there need to be a certain size to it before you call you declare it as an actual forest fire well yeah we do we separate incidents where the fire wardens go out and actually it is not a uh, wildfire um you know different responses they do these are actually wildfires. We're probably in the area of anywhere between um, one quarter acre up to, I think, maybe 50 acres. We haven't had anything much larger than that this year. But uh, yeah, all those fires were basically quarter acre in size up through um, 50 acres. Thank you. Thank you, Dino. Thank you, Bill. Rosemary, Missouri. Rosemary, WNYC. Rosemary, you look to be muted. Okay, uh, Rosemary, we'll uh, come back to you. Uh, does anybody else have other questions for our speakers today? Uh, Ray Zardetto. Ray, you're muted. Okay, thank you for telling me that. You can hear me now? Yes, sir. Good morning. Um, one of the early comments, John, I think you made it, talked about the climate change study and the extension of the fire season by um, 10 days. I think you said in North Jersey and four days in South Jersey this year. Have there been other studies in the past that you can put those numbers in context at all as to whether, you know, this is an anomaly or this is a this is a growing pattern and do you see it continuing this way? It's a good question, Ray. Um, I guess I would ref refer back, you know, in 2020, the DEP put out our own scientific report 
which looks at you know lots of references and resources about climate change. Um, and through that consideration was anticipating projecting lengthened fire seasons and the and the frequency and increasing frequency in large fires. Um, the specific numbers of 10 days in northern New Jersey and four days in southern New Jersey was a report done by Climate Central. And there they considered 50 years of climate or weather data. Um, so, you know, when you step back and think about 50 years and on average over those period, that period of time, we're seeing this increased lengthening in the seasons, 10 days in the north and, and four days in the south. Uh, you know, that that body of evidence provides that that guidance to us that the season is is lengthening. I think, you know, practically we're we're kind of feeling that, right? And so over the last several years, we've had very warm January, February, March months. Thank you. Uh, for our speakers, Rosemary has posted. For our speakers, Rosemary has posted her question in the chat. She's having some sound issues, but her question is, it sounds like this year's fire season is better than in previous years. What has made the difference in controlling this? Well, I, I mean, the weather. You know, we've had substantial rain, you know, March, and you know, here we are starting off in April and it's been pretty wet. Um, we're above average rainfall. We have rain coming over the next few days, so, um, you know, it's the weather right now. It's just prevented a lot of those fires from occurring. But with that being said, that doesn't mean that it's not going to all end. Last year we started in March and we were up through September and October, just nonstop being busy. Lots of major fires. We had 14 major fires last year, started in May, uh, March and ended in mid September. So, um, you know, I think right now we got a reprieve, but it's it's certainly not over. We're a long way from being over. And we've just seen an increase. You know, history sooner or later repeats itself. Um, it's inevitable. We might not be busy right now, but rest assured we will be busy before it's all over. I would yeah, just, just emphasize. Add, oh, go, go ahead, Grant. You want me to go? Yeah, I just wanted to add a little bit to what <clears throat> what bill said uh and the importance of this messaging um consider that 99 percent of uh, all wildfires are started by people whether accidentally or intentionally so you know poor weather and delayed spring and nice days you know is keeping people inside and they're not out and about and so the um occurrence of fire starts uh, isn't happening uh, as frequently. Uh, and so that's a that's another factor that um, that's happening. But, you know, we saw last year that wildfire risk in New Jersey is real. Um, and, you know, it's not necessarily a matter of if it's going to happen. It's a matter of when it's going to happen. And what people I think may overlook is that unlike other natural disasters, snow events, hurricanes, tornadoes, that you can have predictive models help you uh, determine when they're gonna occur and where they're gonna occur. You, you really can't do that with wildfire. You know, um, we have to be prepared uh, uh, everywhere at all times. Yeah, well said. I, I was just gonna emphasize the variable nature of the weather that we're experiencing, right? We've gone through these periods of almost getting to drought conditions, and then we have excessive rainfall, and it just kind of keeps cycling through. And yet within a couple of days, even when we've had lots of rain, like just recently, within a couple of days, it'll particularly in the pylons, it'll dry out really quick. And if it's windy and, and there's an ignition source, we're, we're kind of off to the races. So to really emphasize two things, the variable nature of the weather pattern and people being mindful of that, and then being responsible and being aware for the actions that people are taking when they're using flammable materials and, and sources that start fires. Thank you for addressing Rosemary's question. I just, um, before we go to the next question, uh, Ray, I just wanted to point out that uh, I can get you a link to the 2020 scientific report on climate change that our speakers mentioned in case you're not familiar with it. 
Um, there is an excellent executive summary at the front of it that gives a great overview of the report. So you may find that helpful, but I'll get that to you after the briefing. I appreciate that. Thank you. Sure. Um, other questions? Uh, we can circle back. Uh, looks like we've been through the first round of questions. If anybody has follow-ups, please use your raise, uh, raise hand function. Dino. Uh, no, if I raise my hand again, I didn't mean to. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Uh, is there anyone else with questions for our speakers? Um, anything else that our speakers would like to add or address or follow up on? Any final points to make? I guess, Karen, just to thank you to the press for your assistance and getting the message out. You know, it's really important for us to keep the public aware, keep keep be clear in the current situations as you know incidents arise really um, reference you back to our Facebook and Twitter feeds we've certainly been using both of those outlets to help communicate current status of issues whether that's prescribed burning or if a wildfire incident occurs so um, just really appreciate your help and getting the message out so thank you and one last final call for questions OK, uh, just a reminder that the names and titles of our speakers are in the chat, along with my contact information. It's karen.shinsky at dep.nj.gov. I will make sure to send out the definitions list that Greg referenced earlier. And uh, if you have any follow up questions after our briefing concludes momentarily, please reach out to me. I'll be more than happy to facilitate getting responses for you. And uh, thank you all again for making the time to join us. And thank you especially to our speakers for uh, doing this annual and very important briefing for our media partners. Have a great rest of the day, everybody. Thanks, Karen. Thanks again, everybody.